see. I already got this going. saving change uh, for the kids. Just see him and he can get you a new can on that. Uh, we had Alan Slayton was out this morning not feeling well. So we need to remember him. We need to remember the Eubanks family uh, the passing of Don. Uh, so big loss for them. So we need to remember them. Those are the only updates I've got. Anybody else have any updates? sensitive to that. Uh, we'll take opportunities when we see him. Uh, tell him the rest of the story, Father, because his birth is just beginning. I'm going to ask you now as we uh, go into this service tonight that you'll uh, help us to keep our, our focus on you. song will be 949. 949. I will enter his gates. We'll sing this song through twice. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day There is beyond the azure blue a 
will be number 684. 684.
Good evening. Good evening. I've ever had a wonderful afternoon. I uh, have often found with preaching that right after I preach on something, um, that uh, it seems like there's always some type of test that I get. Uh, and the question is, am I actually going to obey what I said, what I said from God's word, or am I just going to discard it? It's kind of a question. Are you going to be a hypocrite, Adam? Well, this morning I spoke about parenting disciplining your kids and let's just say we had a little bit of a testing this afternoon with our, our kids and uh, I guess with this one why do bad things happen to good people I hope that I don't get a test on this one either it's not something that we like talking about we don't like talking about bad things we don't like enduring bad things but we certainly have this question come up in our minds from time to time why do bad things happen to good people why do children have cancer? Why do hardworking people lose their jobs? Why, why do people that we've always leaned on in our life, that have been our rock, suddenly pass away? We ask these questions and, and ask, why, God, why would you allow this? If we were God in heaven, almighty, had all the power in the universe, I think most of us would say, that we would try to rule the world in a fair way, a just way, where those who did good would receive good and those who did wickedly would receive negative things. Wouldn't that be more fair? Wouldn't that be a more fair way of doing things? You know, we ask this question, why do bad things happen to good people? It's a question that we often ask in our time, but we need to realize this is a question that people have asked for, for thousands and thousands of years. We see that in the book of Job. In the book of Job, we have here a situation. I'm not sure if this is working for me. There we are. We have a situation in the book of Job. Where we have a, a person who was prosperous in his life. He had plenty. He had servants. He had, he had cattle. He had children, he had his health, and all of that comes to ruin all in one day. All the while, this person is a righteous person, someone who has done right, who has a relationship with God. And here in this book, we find Job and his three friends wrestling with this question, why does this happen? What is, is going on here? And why is God allowing Job to suffer in such a way? Well, from the perspective of Job's friends, Eliphaz the Tenomite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Nathamite, you thought your last name was bad, <laughs> the way that they approach this situation is that they tell Job that calamity has fallen upon him and his family because of his sin. In their worldview, God upheld justice in every single thing that happened in the world. That everything that happened in the world is just. That the righteous inherit good things. And the wicked come to ruin. And therefore, since God micromanaged the world with his justice, they believed that Job had sinned. There in the book of Job, Eliphaz speaks first. Job chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Elphaz says this, As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. Later in the book, Job 15 and verse 20, Elphaz says this, The wicked man writhes in pain all his days through all his years that are laid up for the ruthless. So what Elphaz is saying is that bad things happen to wicked people. He even goes as far to say in chapter 22 and verse 5 that 
that here Job is abundant in his wickedness. He asks the questions, is not your evil abundant? There is no iniquity, excuse me, there is no end to your iniquities. And then he continues on in chapter 22, trying to make up sins and attributing them to Job. And he was doing that because by saying that Job sinned in this situation, it was a way for Eliphaz to prove that God was just. Bildad was the second friend that spoke. In Job chapter 8, he had a long discourse where he says in verses 3 and 4, Does God pervert justice? Or does the Almighty pervert the right? He goes on here and he blames his kids, Job's kids, who had died, for their own demise. He says, If your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. He believed they died because they had sinned against God. Verses 5 and 6, If you will seek God and plead with the Almighty for mercy, if you are pure and upright, surely he will rouse himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. Verses 20 and 22 says, Behold, God will not reject the blameless man, nor take the hand of the evildoers. He will yet fit your mouth with laughter, your lips with shouting. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the tent of wicked will be no more. So here with Bildad, what he's saying is if you just repent, Job, if you just turn to God, that God will restore your front fortune, and he will make you prosperous again. All you have to do is turn and repent towards God. And finally, Zophar. Zophar says this. This is in reaction to Job, saying that he was innocent. Job 11, 4 through 6. For you say my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in God's eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. For he is manifold in understanding. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. See, Zophar goes even further. Not only is he saying that Job is sinful, but he says that God is actually giving you less punishment than you actually deserve. You actually deserve more punishment than you are getting in this situation. And so for these three friends, for them, everything happened in the world was because God is just. And the only way to explain this whole situation, all these calamities that Job went through, was because that he had sinned, or even their children had sinned against God. And we look at that and we think to ourselves, that, that can't be true, right? It can't be true. We, we certainly see a situation in the world where, where the righteous suffer and the wicked, they prosper. How in the world could these friends think this to be true? The thing is, is that this is not just a thing that was confined to Job's time. Job probably lived between four and 6,000 years from our time right now. But much later than that, in Jesus' times, we still see this thought process coming across. In John chapter 9, we see that Jesus and his disciples passed a man that was born blind. And as they do so, the disciples ask the question, Who sinned? Who sinned, this man or his parents? The disciples, devout Jews in the first century... They were still thinking, if this person is suffering, it's because either he, he sinned or his parents sinned. Another time in Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter 13, here we see a, a crowd has come together and is speaking with Jesus. And it says there in verse 1, there were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood had, Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. So here we find people who've died, and Pilate mingled their blood with sacrifices. And there must have been some type of hint here that the reason, the reason that they suffered in such a way was because of their sin. And so Jesus answered them in verse 2, and he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? And then Jesus further says in verse 4, or those 18 on whom the, the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they are worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Here he's responding to their notion, this, this thought process, this worldview 
that says, if someone is suffering, it's because of their sin. And even though that might have been 2,000 years ago, I think we can see how relevant it is, even in our worldview. So many people in the world believe the very same thing. We have this idea in our culture of karma. What goes around comes around. If you do something nice for something, it's going to come back on you in blessing later on. On the other hand, if you do wicked to someone else, that wickedness will come back on you as well. Sometimes uh, I'll be telling someone something good has happened in my life, something that worked out just right, and they'll say something along the lines of, you must be living right. And their thought process of saying that, it's saying that this good thing that it's happening to you is happening because you are living the right way. Those who are fans of basketball understand the phrase, ball don't lie. And that is, if you get called to someone, you, the referee calls a foul on you that you think is unjustified, and the person gets up there to shoot the free throws and he misses the free throws, you say, ball don't lie. In other words, you get what you deserve. You didn't deserve that free throw in the first place, and that's why you missed it. We often have this thought process go through our culture, and it's, and it's invading Christianity. So often we see this prosperity gospel that is preached, that God wants to bless you with prosperity in this life, with wealth and with health. And they say, if you just repent and turn to God, God has all these blessings that he just wants to unlock and, and just flourish in your life. That's what God wants to do. The implication in that teaching, though, is... The reason, the reason that you're suffering, the reason that you're not prosperous, the reason you don't have money, or you don't have help, is because you have sin in your life. In other words, you're getting what you deserve. So where does this come from? Where does this idea that you get what you deserve come from? And is it biblical? Do we find places in the Bible where this might be true? Well, I certainly believe there are Proverbs that seem to hint at this. Let me read a few to you. Proverbs 3, verse 33. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Proverbs 13, 25. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked suffers want. Finally, Proverbs 14, verse 14. The backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways, and the good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. Well, that kind of seems right, that if you live a good life, you will have prosperity. That your dwelling will be secure. That, that you will have plenty to eat. At the same time, we have to remember that these are proverbs. They're not promises. They're proverbs. They're rules of thumb. And that means that this is what is generally true. If you generally walk in the wisdom that God has given you, then you're generally going to have good things happen to you, even in this life but much more in the next. If you do that which is foolish, you're probably going to reap the consequences of that foolishness. So we need to understand these are not promises. They are proverbs. And at the same time, we also see throughout the scripture where, where this, these proverbs don't ring true. Even though chapter 13 of Proverbs, verse 25, says that the, the, the righteous, that they will have their appetite filled, even though it says that, we find Paul in Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13, where he says, there's been times where I've gone without, where I haven't had enough food to eat. Certainly, Paul was a righteous person. Why didn't he have his stomach full? And then we read about so many other righteous people that suffered for their faith. They were thrown into lionses. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. Hebrews chapter 11, often called the Hall of Faith, we have all these righteous people being named from the Old Covenant. At the end, it kind of has this grand finale where it says, starting in verse 36, Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. That doesn't sound good. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Ouch. They were killed with a sword. They went about in, in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, on whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains, and cave, dens and caves of the earth. These people were righteous. They were people full of faith. They were faithful. At the same time, they faced so much hardship in their life. 
There are so many times we see that, that people suffer, and it's not because of their sin. It's not because they did anything wrong. I believe that's the lesson that we learn from the, the book of Job. Because with Job, we know, according to the scriptures, that his suffering was not because of his sin. Instead, it was because of his righteousness, because of his faithfulness to God. We read about the beginning of Job where Satan approaches God and says to God, the only reason that, that Job is serving you is because you have given him everything that he wanted. If you take all that away, Satan said, then he will turn and curse you. That's what he said. We have that knowledge that, that Job did not suffer because of his sin. He suffered for his righteousness. I think for us, that should create some humility within us. That when we, we see someone hurting, suffering, going through pain and loss, that we don't automatically think to ourselves, oh, it's because they aren't right with God, because they're sinful. We see that was proven to be false here in the book of Job. And so when a natural disaster hits or, or some calamity happens to a family, don't automatically say, oh, it's because of sin. Now, it could be. It could be, but it doesn't always have to be. And we see that with Job and his situation. But what's amazing to me about Job's situation is that Job, Job doesn't ever really know, according to what we find in the Bible, he never knows why he's suffering. He never knows the reason of why he was suffering. We get, in the, in the scriptures, we get a capture of what happened in that heavenly scene where, where Satan approached God. We, we see that he was suffering because of his righteousness. But Job didn't see that. In fact, when God answered Job after this long book, God doesn't explain to him, see, the reason you're suffering is because you're really, really faithful. God doesn't say that. In fact, when God answers Job, the question he asks is, is who are you? Where were you when I created the foundations of the earth? Are you someone that can control the sunrise or can control the weather? Are you someone that can sustain the animal life here on earth? What God is doing is he's showing how vastly greater God is than Job and his friends. That his wisdom is far beyond their comprehension. And because he is so much greater, so much mightier, so much wiser, here we see that God wanted Job to trust in him. To trust a God who knew the whole picture. See, the thing is about Job and his friends talking about why he's suffering is that they had limited information. They had a limited worldview. They didn't know the whole situation. They didn't know what was happening in the heavenly realms. Because of that, God shows us at the end of this book, they had no possible way of making a claim of whether God was just or not based upon the things that happened to Job. They had a limited perspective. There's no way that they could have known what happened in heavenly realms. So when it comes, comes to us and when we are suffering, when, when good people in our lives, they suffer, or even when we suffer, there are times when we might never have answers. There's sometimes when we might get a hint of this or that. Maybe it's because of the sin of other people. Maybe it's a discipline for what, what we've done in the past. It, there could be a whole ton of, of answers that we might fill in the blank, but we never will know fully. We never will have the limitless understanding of our situation and of our life that God has. We will never have that. We are all limited. And I know we want answers. We want to know why God allowed this, why God allowed that. Why did why is all this suffering happen to his people? We, we ask that all the time. But there's tough, we need to realize that there's, there's some situations that we'll just never know about. We'll never know why it is happening. We'll never know why young little Tiana Williams suffered so much as a little kid with cancer. We'll never know why my mentor, Stan Mitchell, who was teaching at Free Hardman, training men and women to go across the world to spread the gospel. 
why at age 62 he, he just had a heart attack and, and, and fell brain dead right there in the middle of campus. When he had decades that he could be serving the church and doing good in the world, why God allowed him to die? You might never know why Tammy had so many years of suffering. Or why Don Eubanks was taken at the age of 79. We never will know. These were good people, righteous people. But they suffered. We might never have all of the answers. But just like Job, God calls us to trust in him. To know that his wisdom is greater than our wisdom. There at the end of Job, Job chapter 42, here Job repents and dusts his dust and ashes. And he says to the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And he says, Who is this that hides counsel with knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I do not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. So many times we can say that right along with Job. And that is that you are too wonderful for us. You go beyond our comprehension. And even though we want answers, sometimes we just don't have it. We just, in those moments, have to trust that God will be faithful to us. And I think that we have a huge advantage over Job in our day and time. First of all, because we see why Job suffered. We see that God was still being faithful to him even when he was suffering. We have a better vantage point than Job over his own situation. But even more than that, we live on this side of the cross. And we have seen that God has sent his son, his only son, the only person on this world that was perfectly righteous, who deserved no wrong. He sent him to endure wrong to endure suffering because of what we did, because of what we deserved. He took on what we deserved so that we did not have to face what we truly deserved by our sins. God was willing to allow his own son, his perfect son, to die for us, to suffer for our sins. It's amazing if you think about that. And the fact that he was willing to go through all that so that one day, none of us will ever have to suffer again. If he went through all that to prevent us from suffering in eternity, then we ought to be able to trust him with our lives. We ought to be able to, to trust him when bad things happen to good people, when bad things happen to us, to trust his wisdom. If he was wise enough to create the whole world and to sustain the whole world, we ought to trust him. Him with our lives. We ought to trust Him with His plan. We know according to Romans 8, 28, that all things work out for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Now it might not be good in that, that situation, what we might call good. We might have to suffer in that situation, but even that suffering, God is working that throughout history to bring about the good for those who love Him. Trust His plan. He's got a plan. And finally, trust his justice. Trust that he is going to do what is right. We might not understand it in the moment, but he's going to do what's right. And in the end, he will make all things right. He will reward the, the righteous with the eternal life. And he will punish those who have done wickedly against him. Trust his wisdom. Trust his plan. Trust his justice. Trust him. Because he loves us so much. And we see that as we look at the cross. As he allowed the most good person, the goodest person, the righteous son of God, to suffer so that we don't get what we deserve. So that we can have eternal life with him. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, we come before you with humility. Knowing, Lord, that, that we don't know the full picture of our lives. We don't know what's happening in the heavenly realm. But what we do know, Lord, is that you have displayed your wisdom in all creation. You do it day by day as you, you make the sun rise and as you cool us or, or warm us with 
the certain weather that comes our way. We trust in you, Lord, not just because of, of your wisdom, but because of your mercy and your grace. That you sent Jesus to die for us. That you cared enough about us to allow your own son to suffer. We trust in you, Lord, because you are faithful to us even when we are unfaithful to you. And we pray, Lord, when we face those difficulties, when we suffer or we watch the ones we love suffer, and we grapple with these questions, that we will have that overriding faith in you, that overwhelming trust that you are there, that you are faithful, that you're working all things out for good, and that you will make things right in the end. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's someone here tonight that needs to respond to what God did for us through Jesus, that we don't get what we deserve, but that we will have eternal life with him. If you need to have your sins washed away, to have that hope of eternal life, we'd encourage you to do it this evening. Or if you need encouragement and strength in prayers, we would also encourage you to do that as well. If you have any need, please come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song. He paid a debt he did not owe. Summerfield has come forward and he wants to be baptized tonight and so we're going to honor his request in just a moment um, and so uh, Jerry, Joe, maybe get some songs together and start doing it as we go uh, back and change so ready to break Number 394. 394. Leaning on the everlasting arms. We'll sing all three verses. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, 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 
Of this young man. Um, I, it's been such a joy watching you uh, grow up. And I told him, we're sitting there on the front row, that it's just, uh, he's always had a good heart. He really has. And uh, I'm grateful that he is willing to take this step to be right with God. I'm thankful his parents and sister can be here with us as well to watch this. And just really proud of you. So I'm going to ask you an important question. Austin, do you believe that Jesus Christ is? Wonderful thing. Amen? Amen. All right. Now we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. You will have the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he will help you to walk with God each day. songs and then we can yeah. pray with Austin here after we get changed. We're 272. 272. We'll sing all three verses. verses. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with Seventeen. 
If you haven't partaken of the Lord's Supper yet, you can go to the door on my left and Dennis will assist you. Number 717. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. Four hundred, four zero zero, living by faith. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything. Tempest may blow when the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alone, that skies, the master looks on at the strife.
Let's pray together. Holy and righteous Father, who art in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, for this wonderful day. Thank you, Lord, that we've had the opportunity to be here today to worship you, Father, gather around your table, sing songs of praise unto thee, and to hear your message proclaimed. Thank you so much for your message and what it means to each and every one of us, Lord. We pray that as the one for that was baptized tonight, Lord, that he'll continue to strengthen himself, Father, and continue to, to look to the his word for your guidance, Lord, and uh, for his guidance and continue to be with him. Be with the Father, those that are battling with disease and those that are, that are battling with just sickness, Lord. We pray especially for them. We pray that they could be back again with us in the next appointed time. Continue to watch over each one of us, Lord, and be with those that will be traveling this holiday, Lord. Continue to watch over them. Be with us always. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Got any yet? Ready? Yeah, I can send that to you. I got it. Yeah. 